Happy Sabbath, everyone. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. And we need a Savior like that because in these days when there's so much fear, we need a Savior who can give us rest today. We're looking at how to experience rest in God as we prepare for the end. And of course, as we go along, approaching the end, we're going to see a lot. The Bible says men's heart will be failing them for fear because of the things that are coming upon the world. But God wants his people that in spite of what happens, he wants us to experience his rest. Amen? So we're going to pray and then ask that the Spirit of God will teach us this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father and merciful God and Savior, today we thank you so much that we can assemble to listen to a message that only your Spirit can give. And Father, we ask that you may hide us behind the cross and help that only Christ and Him alone will be lifted up. May he alone be seen, be known, and heard. Is our prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. I want to look at Hebrews 4. You know, in Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4 is a wonderful chapter when it comes to Sabbath rest. There are seven components of Sabbath rest to mention in the book of Hebrews. And we want to look at them one by one. Number one, claiming God's promise of rest. There's a promise of rest. Amen? Amen? God has made a promise of rest to his people. When Israel left Egypt, the Lord said, I am taking you to a land where you have rest. And that was a symbol of the heavenly Canaan. Number two, mixing the word of God with faith. They were required to mix the word of God with faith. They did not experience rest because they did not mix the word of God with faith. God says we, that is how to get rest or to experience rest. Number three, cease from our own works. God is a God rested when he finished his work of creation. In other words, he tells us how to rest. That we must first work. Work comes before rest. Adam did not work. God is who was working. But nonetheless, it was God's rest. Not Adam's rest. Praise the Lord. So when we are rest, talking about rest, we're talking about God's rest. Amen. Number four, labor to enter into rest. We talked about that already. That work comes before rest. If a man does not work, he can't enjoy rest. So the word of God is saying, we must labor so that we can rest. Praise the Lord. Number five, knowing Jesus as our high priest. Hebrews 4, we must know him, we must know who is the pastor of the church. Jesus Christ is our high priest. And therefore we must come to him in confidence to pray and claim every blessing, including rest. Number six, we must experience victory through faith in the righteousness of Christ. Victory is not in our righteousness. Our righteousness is what? Filthy rags. But the righteousness of Christ gives victory. And number seven, we must keep the seventh day Sabbath as God's sanctified rest. Amen? God said, that's my sign between me and you. Yeah. Oh, praise the Lord. So we, we want to push on now and look at them one by one, claiming God's promise of rest. How do we do that? Hebrews 4, 9. There remained therefore a rest to the people of God. Verse 1. Let us therefore fail. In other words, Hebrews did not experience the rest that God promised. They came short. They fell short. The Bible is telling us we have to be careful. We don't want to fall short. God doesn't want us to fall short. So God is saying, let us therefore fear Lest the promise be left us of entering into his rest. Remember, the rest is whose? God's rest. It is God's rest. And therefore, 
we must fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. And I must always remember that Adam did not work. Adam rested. It was God who worked. And Adam rested in God's rest. Amen? And there, there are many times we're going to find that it is God who alone can work because the work of salvation is whose? It's God's work. And we are to, uh, unless we rest, nothing will be done for us. Number two. So God rested after his work of creation. Genesis 2, 1 says, and verse 2, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested. He rested on the seventh day from all his work. Praise the Lord. So God rested. God shows us that work comes before rest. There's a work for us to do. There's work for us. Even though we have to rest and let God work, there's something for us to do. And we're going to see that as we go along. It's for prophecy, volume 3. It says, page 204, Christ rested in the tomb. Christ rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day, and on the morning of the first day of the week, he rose from the grave to renew his work. A lot of people are saying, we are keeping Sunday because we are honoring the resurrection. But on the resurrection, Christ rose up to work. Amen. He did not, he did not, if he wanted to rest, he would have stayed in the grave for another day. But he didn't do that. So the argument does not hold water. Inspiration says, when upon the cross he cried out, it is finished. He addressed the Father, I have done thy will. I have completed the work of redemption. So the work of redemption was completed. Then Christ went in the grave and rested. And on Sunday, he rose up to work. Praise the Lord. So God's promise of rest to so Israel. Let us see what it was associated with the land of Canaan. This is number one. The land of Canaan, remember, was a symbol of the heavenly Canaan. So when we think of rest, of course, the Sabbath must remind us that God, Jesus, is coming to take us to a heavenly home. Where we have rest. What else? It was also associated with victory over the enemies round about. What does those enemies stand for? Victory over the enemy of sin and temptation. That's our enemies. Self, believers, is our worst enemy. Self is our worst enemy. And so, therefore, God is saying to us, I want to give you rest, but I want you to experience victory over sin. I want you to overcome sin. Temptation must cease to be a temptation. So God wants to build us up in our holy faith. God wants us to have trust in him. God wants us to have a new mind that we will not desire the things of the flesh. We must have victory over the flesh, the world, and the devil. Have a renewed mind as we heard this morning, even the mind of Jesus Christ. The mind that hates sin and loves righteousness. Praise the Lord. That's the mind. So understand the promise of rest. What is it that we need to understand about rest? In claiming the promise of rest, we are to claim victory over sin and defects of character. So we don't understand that this is what we need, we, we need rest from. Sin and temptation. Number two, we are to claim restoration to the full image and likeness of God because that is what God is doing in the work of redemption for us. When we get that, then we have rest. And we can claim these promises every single day. We can claim Christian character perfection every day of our lives. 
Because that is the work that God is doing every day in you. And at the end of the day, we must be able to look and say, this is a good work. When God was finished creation, every day he could say, behold, it was very good. So every single day, we can look and see that what God did in us was good. He had brought us one step more to look like Jesus. Number two, mixing the word of God with faith. Hebrews 4 for unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word did not profit them. The word that was preached to them did not profit. Why? It was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now we which believe do enter into rest. So rest have to do with believing the word of promise. It is the, the gospel is the promise of God that is preached to us. That's the gospel. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So God finished the work. Even the work of redemption was finished from the foundation of the world. The work of creation had made ample provision for redemption. That's why we are told that the plan of redemption was not an afterthought. God was not caught by surprise and had to scramble together to put things together for as an emergency plan. No. So even redemption was catered for in the plan of creation. And that is why we have the reproductive system to accommodate the birth of Jesus Christ in the incarnation. Praise the Lord. So Christ could come into the world and be one of us. In fact, he came into the world and he became us. The Bible says he became our sin for us. And we became righteousness, the righteousness of God, which he was. Took our place. What an exchange. What an exchange. Faith, love, and trust go together. For in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, neither circumcision avail anything nor uncircumcision, but faith, which works by love. Faith works by love. Because and unless we love God, there's no exercise of faith. It is because of our love for God, our response to his love, that we will go and, be, and to his word, study it, and believe it with all of our hearts. It is our love for God that causes us to see and believe and, and claim the word of God. Faith works by love. And therefore, God depends on us. As we look at the cross of Christ and see the love of God revealed, to respond to that love and be motivated by that love to be obedient to God and surrender to Jesus Christ. God is depending upon us to depend upon him. Praise the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Very often our own understanding will compete for the word of God. God says, forget your own understanding. But we will not do that except we love God. Then we will say, look, I don't want my own understanding. I trust God. Amen? I trust him. Lean not unto thine own understanding. On all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall do what? He direct the path. Be not wise, the word says. Be not what? Wise in thine own eyes. My word is not wise. It's not, it's, it's not, it cannot be compared with the word of God. I will just be led astray if I trust my word. Be not wise in thine own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. Faith and love are inseparable. We saw that just now, but let's look again. Acts of the Apostles 2.6.2. Paragraph 3, one of the strongest evidence, this is not my word, one of the strongest evidences of true conversion is love to God 
and man. That's why John says in the Bible, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. You cannot say you love God and hate your brother. Wow. Those who accept Jesus as their Redeemer have a deep, sincere love for others of like precious faith. As touching brotherly love, the apostle wrote, ye need not. You know, listen to Paul. Paul says, ye need not. Are they right on to you? For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So Paul is saying, don't even wait for me to send a message to tell you love one another. Because God himself is teaching you to love one another. Wow. God himself is teaching you that. If you have the spirit of God, you will naturally love your brother. That's what the Spirit of God teaches. Christ of the Lesson 67, paragraph 3. It says, as you receive the Spirit of Christ. So we are to receive the Spirit of Christ. What did Christ teach us? He says, a new commandment I give unto you. And that is what? They love one another. So the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of love. The Spirit of unselfish love and labor for others. You will grow and bring forth fruit. Wow. The graces of the Spirit will ripen in your character. Listen. Your faith. What about faith? My faith will increase. Your faith will increase. Your convictions you feel convicted under the work, under the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that will deepen. What about your love? Your love will be made perfect. More and more, you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, all that is noble, and all that is lovely. Praise the Lord. So this is the image of God being restored. This is the believer being restored to look like God again, to look like Christ. So we felt when we look at Adam in, in the garden, if anyone was to look at Adam, they would see Jesus Christ standing right behind Adam. When people look at you, they must see Jesus standing behind you. A reflection. And that's what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, 27, he says, No man knows the Father but the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So anytime you see the Father, it's because he's reflected in Jesus Christ. Wow. Great controversy, 593, 594. Only those who have been diligent, we heard it this morning. The faith... Faith must be manifested by love of the truth. And so when you really love the truth, you will become a diligent student of the word, of the scriptures. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received what? The love of truth. We, heard, we, we see that in 2 Thessalonians 2. Receive the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusions that takes the world captive. So love of the truth will shield us from, from going astray. Uh, because when we go astray, we will not experience rest. We've gone in the wrong path. God keeps us in the right path so that we can experience rest. That's great controversy 6 to 5. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand to the last great conflict. In other words, none but those who have developed a love for the truth will stand through the last great conflict because none but those who have a love for the truth will fortify their minds with the truth. Wow. Number three, seeds from our own works. 
The Bible says in Hebrews 4.10, we're looking at Hebrews, we're looking at the seven components of rest in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 4 says, He that has entered into his rest, he also has seen from his own works, as God did from his. So in other words, God teaches us, as I said before, that work must precede rest. Because that's how he did it. And remember, it is not our work, and that's why Adam did not have to work. Because it is God's work and God's rest. Praise the Lord. Verse 4 says, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his work. So it is God's work, praise the Lord, and it is God's rest, oh, praise the Lord. If we let God work, We can enjoy God's rest. What is our work? We saw it already. Isaiah 64, 6. We are all as an unclean thing. And our righteousness are what? Filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So our sin disqualifies us. Our righteousness, therefore, that we will do is like filthy rags. Therefore, it is only by the righteousness of Jesus Christ that makes us acceptable to God. And that gives us victory, as we shall see, over every sin. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it, send, it says, God works His righteousness in us. And it says, we are to be confident in this very thing that he which had begun what? A good work. So all the work of God, whether creation or redemption, is a good work. Praise the Lord. And it says he had begun that good work. He will continue that work until Christ comes. For it is God, verse 13 of chapter 2, which worketh in you, the Bible says, not me. God which worketh in you to do what? Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Praise the Lord. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. So the word of God, Christ invites us therefore to rest. He says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will do what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find what? You shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, there's work to do, and my burden is light. It is a different type of work altogether. Praise the Lord. It is the Spirit of God doing the work, so it is light, because it's not you that is bearing the burden. Praise the Lord. Number four. Although we are to cease from our own works, yet the Word of God tells us in Hebrews that we are to labor to enter into rest. We, also, we already have a clue. Because labor comes before rest. And we have something to do. Not what we did before. In other words, we are not to labor to earn salvation. We are to labor as we have already earned it. And have the spirit of love to help others to be saved. The Bible says, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. In other words, let us work so that we may rest. Let us labor that uh, we may rest. Let any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Inspiration says, the rest here spoken of is the rest of grace. Wow. The rest of grace obtained by following the prescription to labor diligently. That's the rest of grace. In other words, it's mercy. God, listen, God gave Adam work because work was important to keep him going. When we study the lymphatic system that God made us with, there's something called the lymphatic fluid that is more four times the amount of blood you have in your body. And all of that fluid is in your body. You, you all will learn it when you do the medical missionary course. And let me tell you something. The, the blood has a pump called the heart to pump the blood through the body. But the lymphatic fluid doesn't have no pump. 
The only way it works is by your exercising. And if you don't move, it don't move. So God gave Adam work so that he could move his lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system is the sewage system of your body. That is what cleans your blood and gets rid of the waste. And the waste is gotten rid of through your lymph nodes. So on the arm where it is here, in your pubic area where it is here, that's where the lymph nodes are situated. And that's why they perspire so much. But you cannot use antiperspirant because you're blocking the natural system. Let it flow. If you smell bad, it's because you want to alkalinize your body. It is too acid. So the way to get rid of that smell is not to remove the hair because shaving will damage the lymph nodes. The way to get rid of the smell is to alkalinize your body. Use more alkaline foods, more greens, more vegetables, lots of lemon juice. All right? You're going to learn that in your course coming up. All right. So, with the labor, you have to move. Your body must move. Adam give, God gave Adam work. And the work that God gave Adam was to keep the lymphatic system moving. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We continue. Same quotation. So, rest comes after work. It is not indolence and selfish ease or in indolence and selfish ease that rest is obtained. You and I know that if you don't work, rest will make no sense. Would rest make sense if you don't work? Rest will not make sense because you've been resting all the time. Only from earnest labor come peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, praise the Lord, on happiness on earth and glory hereafter. So when you work for souls, you can rest in this life and you can continue to work for souls and look forward to a heavenly rest when Jesus comes. Oh, praise the Lord. Happiness on earth and glory hereafter. Our faith must work for others. 16 manuscript. There's much for human hands and human faith to do before those who are bound in death-like slumber. Remember Lazarus? When Jesus came to the tomb, they could not believe. So they didn't have no rest. Mary, was, Mary said, look, Lord, you should have been here four days. And you didn't come in time, so he died. And they were all concerned that the fact that Jesus delayed and you should not have delayed. That's a, that's a stressor. Jesus was saying, listen, I am the resurrection, praise the Lord, and the life. Rest in me. I'm the life giver. They could not understand what he was saying. He told them, listen, roll away the stone. That's work. Only those who had faith that Jesus could do something went and rolled that stone away. They had faith to believe. When they rolled the stone away, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus came forth. Christ did what they could not do. When Lazarus came forth, Jesus said, okay, remove the grave clothes. He was wrapped in clothes, grave clothes. They removed it because human hands could do that. There's work for us to do in cooperation with what only the Spirit of God can change the heart. But if you don't bring the word of God to people, God is depending on us to work for others. And that work is a work of faith. Praise the Lord. When I go to win a soul or to give a Bible study, that's a work of faith. I go forward in faith, trusting that the Spirit of God will even go before and convince that person so that I am just bringing the word to them to bring them to a decision. But the Spirit of God has already done the work and God will finish what he has started. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, and so we are told in manuscript 16, it says there's much for human hands and human faith to do before those who are bound in death-like slumber, in carnal security. We continue this labor. This is labor that God, require, God requires. Listen, this is labor 
that God requires. We are told, Christ Epic Lesson 69, paragraph 2, it says it is a privilege. So God has given us something that is our privilege. It's a privilege of every Christian. Not only to look for, so I can stand here and look for the coming of Christ. But, it's, but it says, but to hasten the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ. How can I do that? What is it, what is it that I can do to make Jesus come faster? It says, we're all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory. Wow. How quickly the whole world will be sown with the seed of the gospel. So I am, I, my labor is to sow the seed of the gospel. That's labor. That's labor that God requires of me. Sow the seed with the gospel by bearing fruit. Quickly the, great, the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. So I can hasten the coming of Christ by bearing fruit to his glory and just Scattering the grain. Scattering the grain. Scattering, sowing the seed of the gospel. All right? So God expects that type of labor from each one of us. And remember, that is laboring in faith. That's a faith work. It is God which worketh in you, praise the Lord, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Praise the Lord. Number five, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, we must know Jesus as our high priest. This is the word of God. See and then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. This is a component of rest. The Israelites were to know God in his capacity at that time, whoever he was to them. Jesus, the son of God, he's our high priest. Let us hold fast our profession. In other words, we must understand that we have hope. In a savior, in a high priest. He is there. He's a leader of the church. He's a pastor of the church of God today. And we can trust his leadership. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Everything that you suffer from here to the end of the world, Jesus went through it before you. He was in all points. Tempted like as we are, yet without sin. There's no excuse for giving in to pressure and committing sin. Let us therefore come, how? Boldly unto the throne of grace, because the high priest is there. And therefore we now understand, I can have rest. I can come boldly unto the throne of grace in any situation that I find myself in because the high priest is there and he, I, he understands what I'm going through. Praise the Lord. He understands. I may obtain mercy, the word says, and find grace to help in time of need. Praise the Lord. So with exercise faith in the sanctuary truth, we are told in evangelism, or Review and Herald, May 25, it says in the future, and this is why Satan wants to block this entry. In the future, deception of every kind is to arise. And we want solid ground for our feet. The enemy will bring in false theories, like what? Such as the doctrine, amen? And there's no what? There's no sanctuary. There's no sanctuary. So if there's no sanctuary, there's no high priest. Right. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. Remember, faith is to be exercised. And faith is to be exercised in order to have rest. And faith must be exercised in the work that Jesus is doing for us. The faith and work is essential. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, if you don't have a knowledge of the position and work of your great high priest, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time and to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. So there's a faith that's essential. There's a position to be occupied. And you will not be able to do that Therefore, we will be at sea, not knowing what to do. 
We don't know the form or the shape in which the next event will unfold. We do not know. What is our present duty, therefore? Evangelism. 224, paragraph 1. While Christ, our high priest, is cleansing the sanctuary, the worshippers on earth should carefully do what? Review their life and compare their character with the standard of righteousness. I do not compare myself with anybody. I compare with Jesus Christ. I must see how far short of the image of God I fall so that I can know how much grace I need to plead with God that he may bring me up to that point. Number six, victory through faith in Christ's righteousness. And if you look at all of these components, they're all intertwined with each other. We're told in Desire of Ages 3.24, the only defense against evil is what? The indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in the righteousness of Christ. So our victory at the end of the day will be because righteousness of Christ dwells in my heart. I have faith in that. I believe that Jesus' righteousness in my heart will give me power to be obedient as he was. Remember, it is the righteous obedience of Jesus Christ. And what it did, what it did in him, it will do for me. I must have faith in what it did for him to be done for me. That's faith in the righteousness of Christ. Unless we become vitally connected to God, that's what it means. That's what it, it just dependent upon my connection with God. So unless we become vitally connected with God, we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love, self-indulgence, and temptation to sin. We may leave off we are told, many bad habits, sometimes we put away bad habits. We may part company with Satan for a time. But without a vital connection with God, and we need to talk about a vital connection. What does that mean? A vital connection is a spiritual connection whereby you know that God is your God. Whereby you know that he, you are his child. And whereby he owns, he claims you as a child. You know for sure that God is a part of your life. That there's a relationship between you and God. That's a vital connection. It's a connection whereby you are certain that when you pray, your prayers are not falling to the ground. But that you are relating to God and speaking to him and hearing his voice speaking to you. There's a communication both ways, two ways. Vital connection in which you receive from God and you share your life with him. He dwells in you. So without that vital connection with God, through the surrender, listen to what it says, surrendering yourself to him moment by moment, we shall be overcome. If I don't surrender my life to God moment by moment, I will be overcome. There is no man that I know who can stand, who can go without God, regardless of how high his profession is. We need to surrender ourselves to God every moment, by moment, and there's no time when we can take a holiday. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ, and the continual communion, and continual communion means that even while you are at work, even when you're, you are walking down the street, you are talking to God. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ that you can communicate, and you know that regardless of what you meet, you can ask God for help. Regardless of what uncertainty faces you, you can say, Lord, lead me. Lord, tell me what to do. Some, because every day you will meet things that you didn't expect to meet. I will meet things that I didn't expect to meet. 
But I must have confidence in God. Suppose somebody turns into your bedroom with a knife. And you didn't even know a man was in the house. Can you say, Lord, take charge? You, you just stumble upon some person and something happens a day that you didn't expect. You're going in your car and somebody comes in after you. Shift down. Give me all the money. That's a bandit there and you didn't expect it because you've been going and coming every day fearless. Anything that happens to the Christian, he must be able to say, Lord, take charge. And you must be able to say it with confidence because you have a high priest in heaven and you have a relationship with him. Personal acquaintance, continual communion. If we don't have that continual communion, we're the mercy of the enemy. Say, so no, we'll do anything today, this week. I sometimes come in here, believers, Sometimes they come to work in the office all day I am and forget to lock the, part, the, um, the grill. When I ready to go home in the afternoon, it's wide open. The padlock on the gate in lock. I am going home yesterday, um, Thursday. I left the padlock on the gate. When I am leaving to go home, the padlock gone. Somebody took it. I'll go and buy a new padlock to put on the gate. Yesterday when I'm going home, there's a knife on the ledge, on the gate. I don't know if that's a threat or what. We are sometimes, there's always the unguarded moment. We need to pray every moment. We need to keep abiding in Christ. Those things come to draw us closer to see how much exposed we are. The enemy is always there. We are at the mercy of the enemy and we shall do his bidding in the end. Satan's main aim is to get you to sin. To get you discouraged and to sin. So we begin to wind down. Look at this. Or high calling. No renewed heart can be kept in a condition of sweetness. We need a daily application of divine grace. Even if your heart is renewed, it cannot be kept in a condition of sweetness without the uh, daily application. Look at our word daily application of the salt of the word. Divine grace must be received daily or no man will stay comforted. If you don't apply the word daily, we heard this morning from Brother Young, if you don't study daily, if you don't apply the word and have time with Jesus Christ every day, you will not remain comforted. You will drift. Your mind will drift. You will find that you have a different mind. You will feel the, the, the absence of Christ in your life. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts that we are to repent daily and be comforted daily. That our sins may be blotted out and go beforehand to judgment so that we shall receive the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. Now that is like laboring to rest. We, do the, we, we ask, we surrender every day to God and repent every day. We allow ourselves to be comforted by surrendering daily to the work of conversion by the Holy Spirit. Christian experience, I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment, over pride, selfishness, Love of the world and over every wrong word and action. And this is the point. We are too selfish. We want victory over selfishness, over pride, every wrong word, every wrong action. We should therefore be drawing how? Nearer and nearer to the Lord. And be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. We need to be prepared. All soldiers have to prepare for battle. This is the greatest battle and God expects us to allow him to prepare us for the battle. And we allow him to prepare us by drawing nearer and nearer to him every day. My experience in studying God's word my experience in meditating, 
in knowing Jesus Christ and depending on him every day must be much better improved as I go along. I must know him. I must have more confidence in him more and more every day. Why? Because I have been drawing nearer and having a deeper experience than I had before. Finally, we're to celebrate the Sabbath, number seven, as a sign of our sanctification. Celebrate the Sabbath on the seventh day. We come to celebrate. This is a celebration of all that God has been doing for us during the week. And so we rest. But it was who that was working? It was God who was working. Praise the Lord. God was working as in creation, so in redemption. God, was, God worked in creation. And God worked through every day throughout the week. He works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So what we do, we are resting in him. The Bible says on the seventh day, God ended his work. It is God's work, and therefore it is God's rest, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the day. He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now you have a day that is blessed. You have a rest that is sanctified. And you have people who are resting in that day who are not sanctified. The Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy. Christian experience and teaching. But as he which had called you is holy, Peter says, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. The Bible says, but as he which had called you is holy, so be ye Holy in all manner of conversation. What about the Sabbath? What kind of conversation is acceptable on the Sabbath? Can God, can God sanction the things that we say and do? Is it holy? We are, God cannot dwell with me unless he dwells in me. And if he is holy, there is then my experience on the Sabbath must be a holy experience. Amen. So Peter says, because as it is written, be holy for I am holy. God is telling us, you cannot be otherwise than holy because I dwell in you and I am holy. Spirit prophecy says, let all remember that God is holy and that none but holy beings Amen? Can ever dwell in his presence. Wow. When we come to church, we say we come in the presence of God. But what kind of people are we? What kind of person you bring into the presence of God? Finally, therefore Sabbath rest must be a holy experience. We go to the book of Isaiah. We're closing with Isaiah today. Scripture. 58 verse 13 and 14 says, If thou turn away thy foot, listen how to be holy. This is how God teaches us how to be holy. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. So our pleasure gets, goes out the window. And call the Sabbath a delight. Now, the Sabbath will not be a delight except you have the mind of Jesus Christ. The holy of the Lord. The Sabbath is the, a delight because it is the holy of the Lord. Honorable. And we are to honor him, not doing our own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. We're all guilty. We don't meet up during the week. So when we meet on Sabbath, we want to talk about every single thing before we forget. Because we might not see each other again during the week. You know what that is telling us? That is telling you and I that we don't communicate with each other enough during the week. We need to find some time to talk during the week. The Bible says, no, no not your own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. This is, the, this is how we will experience delight in God. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high place of the earth. These are blessings. And feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. You will have so much spiritual food. 
that you would not be hungry in a while. Amen. God says, I, I said it, so you can believe it. It is the mouth of the Lord that has spoken it. This is true Sabbath keeping. This is a holy experience. Sabbath rest is a holy experience. May God enable us, therefore, believers, to experience the fullness of his rest. Amen? The Bible says, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to come short of it. So it's possible to come short of God's rest. God wants you and I to experience the fullness of his rest. And if we follow these seven components, we will experience rest. Go over the book of Hebrews, especially chapter 3 and 4, and you will learn greater things. The Spirit of God will teach you that you will enjoy God's rest. We are coming to the end of time. And as we wind down, as I said before, events will unfold in a shape and form that you didn't expect. May we find and experience God's rest. Even regardless of what happens, the storm can burst. But regardless of the storm, you and I can rest. We have a high priest in the sanctuary. May God bless you. May God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, merciful God and Savior, today, Lord, we thank you so much that as we go through the book of Hebrews, we have seen that there's rest. We have seen that there is yet a rest that remains to the people of God. A rest that we did not even know exists, some of us. We ask, Lord, that you will forgive us for ignorance and help us now as we surrender our lives to you to learn these things and to experience them day by day, that we will know that we have a high priest in the sanctuary above, and that we can come boldly unto the throne of grace, obtaining mercy and find grace, divine strength to help us in every time of our need. Bless us today. Grant us your peace from here onwards as we seek to experience the fullness of rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.